it gives me my great uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. Marit Kakura, I've known for many years, rather too long, I think, probably, as we're both getting greyer than we used to be, um, who is uh, currently public astronomer at the uh, Royal Observatory Greenwich. Uh, I could read through his long biography, but that would cut into the lecture times. So I'm not going to do that. But the other thing that isn't mentioned there is that he also won our Annie Maunder Medal, the first recipient of that for services to outreach uh, last year. So that was a duly deserved. So I'm going to hand over to Marek now, who's going to tell us about photographing the universe. Marek. Thank you, Robert, and thank you to the RAS for asking me to, uh, to give this talk. Now, this is a subject which is quite close to my heart, um, because apart from looking with our eyes and perhaps peering through a telescope, most of what we know about the universe, or certainly as members of the public, the way we encounter the universe, is through photography. So photography <laughs> and astronomy have been very closely intertwined, um, both in science and in terms of public outreach and engagement, really since the beginning of photography. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that story, but then show you, I think, one of the really great modern outcomes of that partnership, uh, of, which has lasted nearly 200 years now. Uh, and what I'm showing you um, on this title slide is a lovely mural from the uh, Manchester City Hall. It's by Ford Maddox Brown, the pre-Raphaelite artist. Uh, and he did murals showing all sorts of um, good and great from the Manchester area, the history of Manchester. And um, this is a picture of one of their local heroes. Um, it's um, Crabtree, and he, in the 17th century, observed the transit of Venus, um, projected onto a screen, as you can see here. So he saw Venus passing across the sun. I'm sure you've all heard of transits of Venus, very rare events. We had a couple just a few years ago. There won't be any more until the 22nd century. So uh, he was one of the first people ever to observe this. And what he's doing here is he's using a tiny aperture, in this case, the window of his room with a, a little um, telescope and lens on it, to project an image onto a screen. And this is, if you think about it, the basic idea of photography. The only thing he doesn't have here is something to record the image. So he can draw it, he can perhaps trace over it. But um, basically, his room is a camera. Uh, not surprising, really, because camera is Latin for chamber. So here we go. So we've got the beginnings of photography even here. And if we fast forward to um, the 21st century or to 1990, when um, the Hubble Space Telescope was launched. Of course, photography is an integral part of astronomy now, and most telescopes have cameras built into them. You don't look through a modern telescope with your eye. So the Hubble Space Telescope, we could just as easily call it the Hubble Space Camera in many ways. And of course, instruments like this have shown us astonishing things about the universe. Scientifically rich, but also really beautiful, visually and aesthetically pleasing. So here's a beautiful Hubble image of a star forming region and you can see um, up here that the jets coming out of a, a star which is forming inside this clump of gas. There's another one here. So really revealing amazing detail and allowing us to understand more about how the universe works. Beautiful shot, I think, from NASA's Galileo probe of Jupiter's atmosphere of the Great Red Spot, um, twice the diameter of the Earth, this swirling storm feature, really amazing there. Beautiful picture of a galaxy, and again, the camera is capturing so much detail in this object, and you're seeing um, the red glow of hydrogen, you're seeing blue clusters of new stars, you're seeing the yellower, older stars in the center, and the dark bands of dust that mark the spiral arms of the galaxy. So huge amounts of information, but also really beautiful pictures. However, when the Royal Observatory was uh, formed, and for most of the Royal Observatory's history, that wasn't possible. If you were an astronomer looking through a telescope with your eyes, if you wanted to record what you saw, you kind of had to draw it. And this is Galileo's um, drawing of the moon, a very scientifically important drawing, because he's using drawing, he's using art, to, um, to show what he saw through his telescope. And the shocking fact that the moon isn't smooth, as uh, the official line went, but it is lumpy, and you can see shadows that change. And clearly, there are these uh, circular depressions, which he names craters after the Greek drinking vessel. Um, and he conveys this information to the world largely through his drawings. Here are some 19th century drawings of uh, Halley's Comet. Well, these are chalk, I think, or pastel drawings. 
um, some beautiful drawings of what we would now call galaxies, but in those days were called nebulae. Um, and the very famous drawing by Lloyd Ross of the Whirlpool Nebula, which we now know as the Whirlpool Galaxy. Uh, and he really, in this, is really capturing a lot of the detail that we can see in images, uh, photographs from, from Hubble. So really detailed drawing. So you had to be a really good draftsman or draftswoman if you wanted to be an astronomer before the age of photography. This is a drawing made by um, John Herschel, of, uh, son of William, of the Orion Nebula. Uh, and it's a negative drawing, so where he draws dark with his pencil, that's actually light, and of course space, which is white in the drawing, is actually black. Um, and I think he does a pretty good job of conveying some of the structure, but what this shows you is what the eye sees in the Orion Nebula is not what the camera sees. The camera is sensitive in different ways, um, to fainter light, to, to particular colours of light. It doesn't see the universe in the same way as our eyes. But in Herschel's time, this was the only way to see it. Herschel, of course, is almost as famous as a pioneer of photography as he is as one of the 19th century's great <laughs> astronomers. And he helped to drive the technology of photography forwards. If you think of early photography, the two things you needed were very bright lights and things that stayed really still. Those are the two things that you do not have in the night sky. Everything is moving, nothing. Even the full moon is a million times brighter, uh, fainter than sunlight. So he and others like him helped to push photographic technology forward by sort of the, the, the second uh, half of the 19th century, it starts to become a useful tool. And this is, I think, from the 1860s, a photograph of the same region of space, the Orion Nebula. So now bright is bright, and dark is dark, and you can see the photograph is capturing perhaps more detail than Herschel could see, but actually it's still not able to see a lot of the faint structure that, that Herschel was able to see with, with his eyes. However... Photography continues to improve, and by the 1980s, um, you're getting really to the, the, the high point of what you can do with traditional glass plate uh, emulsion photography. And this is by, I think, David Malin, the great, uh, um, well, he's actually British, but he's based in Australia, um, astrophotographer, really taking what you can do with that traditional uh, photographic technology to its limits. And this is the Orion Nebula, and you can see this dark bit here. That's this bit here. And now you're, you're seeing even more than Herschel could see, and it's in full colour to our eyes. I don't know if you've ever looked through even quite a big telescope. The Orion Nebula looks sort of greenish-grey. Greenish-grey because actually our eyes cannot see colour at low light levels, and even a big telescope is not putting enough light onto your retina to see it. The green comes from oxygen, um, as you can see, oxygen light does not dominate the nebula. It's red hydrogen light. But our eyes are much more sensitive to green than they are to red. And the photograph actually is giving you perhaps a more true-to-life image because it's showing you that actually there's a lot more red light in the Orion Nebula than green. So we don't see the universe the same way as photographs do, but they gather a lot of information. So that is the high point of traditional ph photography. In the 1970s, 1980s, astronomers realised that glass plates were, were not going to be able to keep up with the power of the next generation of telescopes. They wanted new technology to record the light, to make an image, and they pioneered um, CC, CCD technology, charge-coupled device technology, electronic camera chips. And this is a result of that. This is Hubble's view of the same object, a billion pixels in this digital image, um, a much greater range of colour, dynamic range, contrast between light and, and dark, really powerful technology. So astronomers, other scientists developed this chip technology for imaging, and of course, in the 1990s, early 2000s, it becomes commercially viable, it becomes ubiquitous, and we all use it today, we all have it on our phones, in our digital cameras. So another legacy and another example of the relationship between astronomy and photography. And now, of course, digital cameras are scattered all across the solar system. Here's one of them on Mars, the Curiosity rover. I think this looks a bit like Wally, -E, that um, uh, <laughs> Disney character, quite cute. And that sends us back images like this, images of the surface of another world. We can't go there yet, but we can put cameras on the surface and see what it, what it looks like. Or it can show a sunset on another world. How amazing is that? So these cameras are very powerful tools, uh, and they allow us to see things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to see. And actually, these digital photographs still owe a little bit of a debt to art, because when we take the information from the digital cameras and turn it into an image that we display on the screen or we print out, 
we have to we have to make decisions about how we display the colours that the camera has recorded. As I say, those cameras don't see the universe in exactly the same way as our eyes do. They are much more sensitive to a fuller range of colours. They can see beyond the visible part of the spectrum, and they can also discriminate much more finely between closely spaced shades of colour. So where we would just really see the same shade of green, Hubble can actually tell that these are actually two very different shades and they're telling you something different. So we have to make lots of decisions about how we display that information in a way that we can make sense of. Um, and we come up with all sorts of colour palettes. And when you do images like this, which are primarily to show to the public, uh, we want them to look nice. We want them to give you a sense of scale, a sense of um, this, uh, this cloud of gas disappearing off into a misty distance. And the colour palettes uh, that we use for making these images are derived from 19th century landscape painting, this is a, love, well, a, a rather um, a harrowing Turner painting of slaves being dumped overboard, but you can see where the colours and the mistiness and, uh, you know, has come from. So again, astronomy and art uh, having this close connection. So camera, telescope, astronomy, art connected um, for the whole history of photography, really, uh, and, of course, now those cameras are available to everyone. And one of the big changes in astronomy in the last 15, 20 years has been that digital camera technology has become commercially available, and it allows amateur astronomers to bolt those cameras to the back of their telescopes, and they can now take images which 20 or 30 years ago only a professional would be able to make. And that has caused a huge explosion in amateur astrophotography. And... Um, also, because we now have the internet, they can share those digital photos around the world. And um, it's all down to this, the digital camera chip. That's what's caused this revolution. And so we decided in Greenwich about nine years ago that we wanted to recognise all the amazing work that was being done uh, by amateurs, photographing the universe and showing us beautiful views of the cosmos that we live in. And so this is where the Insight Astronomy Photographer of the Year competition came from. That's how it was born. And what I want to do for the rest of the talk is really take you through some of the winning images, or all of the winning images from this year's competition. We'll talk about the science, we'll talk about how the photographs were made, but we'll also talk about about some of the personal stories of the people who made them, um, which I think is one of the really great things um, that, that the competition allows us to do. Astronomy is done by human beings, and every astronomer is doing it because they love what they're doing. So those human stories, I think, are just as much a part of astronomy as the scientific results and discoveries that are made. So we'll start with the young part of the competition. This is for photographers under the age of 16, so 15 and under, and they um, are allowed to take photos of anything they like, so it can be through a telescope, it can be a photograph of a beautiful landscape with the night sky in the background. Uh, and the highly commended uh, in this one, this is by uh, Andrea Imazio from, uh, from Italy, called uh, Rosa Mountain, beautiful view of um, uh, a forest at night in the Alps with the stars above. Andrea is seven years old. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Sebastian Gregg from London, a picture of the Orion Nebula, which we just saw. Now, this is really a difficult, difficult photo to um, take because Sebastian lives in London with all the light pollution. So he's used filters on his camera on his telescope to block out the light pollution from streetlights and then used uh, multiple uh, multi-coloured imaging to, um, and then combining those coloured images to produce a full coloured image like this. So really technically accomplished. Um, Sebastian is 13 years old, or he was when he took the photo. Uh, and the, what I really like about this is that he, um, his parents took him to see um, the winning uh, photos from the competition at the exhibition in Greenwich which I encourage you all to come and see, um, two years ago, and it was that that inspired him to take up photography and astrophotography, and two years later, he's won a prize. Fabian Dal Piat uh, from Italy, from the Tyrol, um, Milky Way above Alpi di Suisi in the, the Dolomites range. Uh, an astonishing um, image, really accomplished, again, with the landscape and getting the stars. Really difficult to get the land and the sky um, together, so a lot of um, careful planning and then processing on the laptop Digital images always require processing. It's absolutely allowed. Uh, we just ask the photographers to tell us what they've, what they've done. And um, 
Uh, again, uh, Fabian came to the awards ceremony and um, I asked him if he and his dad were staying around to spend the weekend in London. He said, no, no, we have to get back to Italy because he'd been shortlisted for the competition uh, and his village had asked him to put on an exhibition of his photographs in the uh, community hall. So he had to go back to mount the, uh, mount the photos. But really uh, beautiful. Again, great that he's been inspired and, and goes on to better things. Now we move on to the runner-up uh, in this category. And that goes to Kimberly Ochoa from the United States. And Kimberly's uh, 14. She took this beautiful picture called Snake Moon. And this just shows you the sort of creativity that uh, we see, especially in the young category. It is across, across the board, but especially in the young category. And here, uh, Kimberly, what she's done is she's taken a long exposure of the crescent moon. And she has moved the camera around during the long exposure and drawn with the moon across the plane of the photograph and produced this really beautiful effect, which we all liked and thought, you know, what a fabulous um, imagination she had. Just a beautiful, almost abstract picture. The winner, though, of the young category is this by Olivia Williamson, uh, an amazing photo of Saturn. Um, Olivia is also 13, I think, and uh, she's been doing astrophotography for quite a while. Her father is quite an accomplished astrophotographer, um, but she does this all by herself. Um, I think her dad sort of has taught her, taught her the ropes, and she goes off and she does it. She plans it. She takes the images. She processes them herself. If you know anything about planetary imaging, excuse me, you'll know it is really, really difficult to do. Um, planets are actually, although they're the nearest things to us in the, in the universe, they are small and faint, and also during a long exposure, the atmosphere tends to blur them. So astrophotographers have all sorts of tricks where you take lots of very short exposures and then you stack them all together to remove the blurring of the atmosphere. Uh, you only keep the really sharp pictures, but then you have to make sure that everything is absolutely... Uh, stacked on top of each other. So look at the detail that Olivia has captured in here. You've got um, the, the divisions in the rings. You can see actually uh, not just the main rings, but also um, more detailed structure in there. You can see the bands. You can even see a hint of the polar hexagon in Saturn's atmosphere. And uh, the day after she won this prize, Cassini crashed into Saturn and ended its mission. And we thought it was sort of a fitting tribute that Olivia um, had won with this, this amazing picture. So uh, last year, she won, I think she won a runner-up in, in this category. And I said to her at the time, I, I don't think this is really good, well done, but I don't think I've seen your best work yet. And so lo and behold, <laughs> this year, she, uh, she proved me right. So we move on into the main adult competition, uh, and this is divided up into different subject categories. And I'll start with, I think, one of the most spectacular. It is Aurori. Uh, uh, of course, who doesn't like amazing pictures of the northern and southern lights? And the highly commended in this category was this amazing picture by uh, ZEA, uh, taken from a plane. Um, so um, I think Z knew that there was a high chance of auroral activity. The flight was um, over the, the polar regions um, at night, uh, and I think this is during the summer, so the, the sun is only just below the horizon. Um, and what we liked about this is in, in aurora pictures, you get a lot of green because this is the oxygen 100 kilometres up in the atmosphere being excited by particles from the solar wind, and then oxygen, uh, as we saw in the Orion Nebula, oxygen grow, glows with a green glow. Um, so you, you, get, you get to see a lot of green pictures when you're judging this category. Uh, but here, because of the, the sun just below the, uh, the northern horizon here, you've got these beautiful bands of orange and yellow and then shading into azure blue. So this fabulous contrast of colours, which we really thought was a, a nice uh, touch and a nice change. Runner-up, um, Kamil Nureyev. Um, this is taken in Siberia in autumn dance. What we really liked about this was, of course, the, the detail in the auroral structure, this beautiful curling curtain with the um, vertical striations in it. But it's the composition of the picture, really, isn't it? It's the way he's framed it uh, with the tree down here and then this wonderful sweep up here and the reflections in the water. It's really beautiful. But the winner of the aurora category is this one by Mikkel Beiter from uh, Denmark, although he took it, I think, in Iceland. 
He calls it Ghost World, which I think is a really appropriate title. Again, we see a lot of green in the Aurora category. If you've ever seen it with your eyes, of course it is green, but the camera, again, because it can take long exposures, because it's more sensitive than our eyes, it really ups the kind of the technicolour quotient. Um, and so uh, there is always the temptation in auroral photography to, to make them look really garish. Um, Mikkel has completely gone the other way with this, a very subtle image. Um, and he's realised that although this was a cloudy night... Uh, and the aurora is behind the clouds, um, but actually that produced this really wonderful effect. And we love the, the shelf of cloud and the, the aurora reflected off the, uh, the, the wet sand on the beach down here. Um, and uh, I, I thought it could be the cover of a sort of a Scandi noir thriller, really. So a, a well-deserved well -deserved win there for Mikkel. Next we have Galaxies. And uh, to start with, we have Highly Commended. Again, and this is by Andrei Borovkov, um, and it's of NGC 4565. As you can see, the Needle Galaxy. We just thought a technically accomplished picture, of course. Again, galaxy is quite a difficult subject. You do need a telescope here. So um, although we do have some really great pictures by beginners, uh, having a little bit of experience does really help in this category. But look at the detail in the, um, in the galaxy, this edge-on spiral. You see the, the dark bands of dust. And what we loved was the sort of the composition um, of it with this kind of diagonal slant and placing it kind of in the middle, you really get a sense of, although this is a vast object, it's really far away and it's floating in the, the emptiness of space. The runner-up was this one, uh, NGC 75331, the Dierlich Group. Uh, here is NGC um, 7331 here. Um, and, of course, it's not really a group of galaxies, um, because this one is ten times closer than these galaxies in the background. But Bernard, um, who's from the United States, said that it, it looks to him like a, a mothership launching its drones into space. And I, I think we all agree that there was this great sense of exuberance about the, um, the image, these things sort of popping off um, out into space. So it does give you, again, that sort of sense of depth. The four grand stars in our galaxy, um, NGC 7331, and then way off in the distance, the rest of the Dielic group. So giving you that sort of perspective of looking deep, deep into space. But the winner of the galaxies category was this one by um, Oleg Brizgalov, uh, M63 star streams and the Sunflower Galaxy. Now, the Sunflower is a very popular amateur astronomy target. Um, it's, uh, uh, and you often see photographs of this inner region, the spiral arms, um, the great sort of colour contrast, the yellow old stars in the centre, the blue stars on the edge, and the little patches of pink hydrogen gas in the spiral arms. But what Oleg has done, which I had never really seen before, was as well as capturing the inner brighter parts of the galaxy, getting all of this um, structure from outside, the, the really faint structure, the galaxy continues much further than uh, we're used to seeing. And to capture this as an amateur astronomer, we thought was absolutely stunning. So really great uh, photograph there from Oleg. Well, from the distant reaches of the galaxy back to um, our nearest neighbour in space, our moon, always a popular category. We start with highly commended, and here it is. Sean Goble from the US. Uh, if you are a fan of uh, astronomical observatories, you will recognise this is Mauna Kea. So some quite uh, famous, world-famous telescopes up on the hill here. And this is the moon setting behind the mountain. So taken with a zoom lens from quite some way off, again, absolutely meticulous planning because you had to work out exactly where he needed to be for the moon to set behind the telescopes on that day and then also to work out exactly when. Producing this beautiful composition, great to see the moon in a blue daylit sky, I thought. So really great, um, really great photo there from Sean. The runner-up uh, in the moon category, this again taken to a telescope, uh, uh, Jordi Del Pate Borel, um, from Spain, evening in the Ptolemaeus chain and Rupes Recta region. Um, so we just, again, the detail, the crisp detail in this is really stunning. Very, very accomplished lunar photography. Um, and, of course, he's doing that, that great trick of observing the moon, of looking at the bits um, along the Terminator where um, the sun is setting, and so you're getting these wonderful long shadows that really highlight the, uh, the topography there of the lunar surface. And um, you can see, um, I think what we really liked about it, though, was, again, it was the composition of the photo. So having not just the technical skill and the scientific understanding of what you're looking at, but also that, that aesthetic eye, the way he's divided the image between the rough and the smooth, the, the lit up, 
and the dark gives it this really, I think, quite ominous sense of night falling over this very rugged region of lunar uh, terrain. <coughs> but then the winner uh, of the Air Moon category was this by um, Laszlo Franczyk from Hungary, Blue Tycho. Um, so the Tycho crater, very familiar feature of the moon. Um, but of course, there's more to it than again than we see with our eye. And what Laszlo has done is something that um, actually lunar geologists will also do um, from time to time. It's really ramp up the colour contrast. And then you see that the moon is not quite so 50 shades of grey as we like to imagine it. Um, the rocks, of course, have different compositions because they formed in different ways at different times, and that tells you something about the moon. And here, what you can see, uh, I think I'm correct in saying, the, um, the sort of the browny red, these are rocks that are relatively rich in iron, as you'd imagine, that rusty colour. And the blue are rocks that are rich in, I think, titanium. And uh, you can really see what's going on here. Whatever blasted out the Tycho crater has dug through those upper layers of iron-rich rocks uh, to a layer of titanium-rich rock and then sprayed it out in all directions. So it really, um, we really love this uh, kind of using science and scientific imaging techniques to produce a really kind of striking image. And again, look at the composition that he's used by using this letterbox format and putting the crater off centre. It gives you a real sense of dynamism. You can really imagine that kind of splat of the impact and everything spraying across the picture. Well, moving from the moon to the sun, we go to Highly Commended. This beautiful image uh, by Michael Wilkinson um, called Ghostly Sun. And I think it really does look ghostly, doesn't it? What Michael has done here, again, this is just showing you how quickly amateur astronomers are catching up with the professionals. He has used on his solar telescope, of course, you need tell us that for a sun observation, you need to block out 99.99% of the light, otherwise you're going to burn your, um, burn your chip from your camera. Um, but with the right filters, what he's done is he's used a filter that only lets through a very specific wavelength of um, violet light. It's emitted by calcium atoms excited in the sun's atmosphere. It's called the calcium K line. Uh, and so he's made a monochrome image, black and white image, just using that very one narrow wavelength. And it shows you the sun in a very different way. Um, you can see the solar surface, you can see sunspots, but you can see actually the central regions of these sunspots, which to our eyes would appear dark. They're actually glowing with calcium K light. So it's telling you something about the, the physical processes going on in those, those regions. And then he's colorized this black and white image and of course chosen to use a violet color scheme just as a, a nod to the fact that the, the wavelength that he's looking at is actually indeed violet. Runner-up in the Our Sun category is this one by Eric Toops, um, zooming in on a, a portion of the sun's limb and showing you these amazing sunspots. Again, technically very accomplished. Look at the detail in the sun's uh, atmosphere here. Um, looks like a fur rug, doesn't it, that you could run your fingers through. I wouldn't recommend that, of course. Um, but um, just that real sense of dynamism, I think we all felt. It looks like a, like, a, like a boiling pot of water, doesn't it? Everything's just seething away, which, of course, is really conveying what's happening on the sun with these huge convection cells of hot gas rising up and bursting out onto the surface. But the winner of the Our Sun category was this one by Alexandra Hart, a fantastic uh, solar photographer based uh, in Cheshire in England. Um, and she calls it Mercury Rising. Again, it's a great filtered image of the sun, so filtering out a lot of the light, allowing you to see a lot of detail in the surface. You've got uh, sunspots, you've got uh, these darker, um, these are sort of prominences which are sort of arching off the surface and they're um, looking darker because they don't give off as much light. Um, but what's this? Can you see this tiny little black dot? That is the planet Mercury. That was the transit of Mercury from May last year. So she's captured two things in one image, the sun but also the smallest planet in the solar system moving in front of it, uh, and a wonderful record of a really great, rather rare event. A popular category with photographers, with the public, with the press, is people and space. Like I say, we love people stories, and we love to be shown our relationship with the rest of the universe, and people and space allows photographers to do that in whatever way they choose. And highly commended this year was by Fu Ding Yan, this photo taken in the uh, island of Reunion, 
rather um, light-heartedly called interstellar travel. So it's a very staged photograph, but still a lot of technical skill to get the Milky Way in here, um, and then with a little bit of artificial lighting on the ground. And uh, I think that's the photographer, I don't know if it's the photographer or, or a friend posing in this fabulous sort of homemade spacesuit. Um, and it really has that kind of sci-fi feel, doesn't it? But um, I think also conveys this idea of, you know, that excitement of going out and exploring the rest of the universe. And what we really liked was the way um, the photographer had, had chosen um, a time and a place where the Milky Way kind of lies along the horizon, which gives you that sense of being able to sort of fly into, almost step from that hill out into the universe, which we thought was really great. The runner-up uh, in People in Space was this one by Kurt Lawson and Sean Goebel, again, Sean, um, who won in the Moon category uh, a prize. And uh, this is the cable route of Half Dome at night, so this very famous mountain in, uh, I think it's Yosemite, isn't it? Um, and what they've done is that one of them has set up the camera on its tripod, and the other one has walked this hiking route up the mountain wearing a head torch. Uh, <laughs> and during the, um, this long exposure, very long exposure, of course the Earth has rotated in the stars, draw out trails across the sky. So... Uh, a lovely picture, a lovely interpretation of the people in space theme um, where there are no, you don't see any people, but you see the influence of people and you see human time and astronomical time juxtaposed against each other, Earth and space, all of those lovely elements, just a really beautiful composition. Winner, though, um, there has to be one, was Yuri Zvedzny um, with his Wanderer in Patagonia. Again, Technically very accomplished. Lots of thought has to go into this. This is a long exposure photograph used to get the Milky Way in the background. Um, but while that long exposure is being taken, um, for a very brief moment, um, the photographer or his model has posed here against this rock and switched on a torch just to give you that, that flash of light in the foreground. So again, it's about <coughs> composition, um, but I think it really gives you the sense of the tiny figure alone in this vast earthly landscape and then beyond it, the even vaster cosmic landscape of the, of the Milky Way. Really beautiful, again, technically very accomplished. Planets, comets and asteroids. We saw from Olivia what uh, photographers can do. This is a difficult category, but every year um, the astronomers surpass themselves. So highly commended is this. By Derek Robson from the UK. And... Um, this, we've always called the category planets, comets, and asteroids um, more in hope than anything else, because asteroids, of course, are very hard to capture, even with professional telescopes. Um, you can't see them very well. They're very small, and they are relatively far away. This was a near-Earth object with the catchy name of uh, 164121, 2003 YT1. And um, it is... Um, it's passing by Polaris, the pole star. So the photographer has fixed his camera to track the stars as they rotate. And while the stars rotate, the asteroid is moving against the backdrop of stars. And you see it as this little line. Um, now, I think the photographer has chosen this sort of rather uh, striking kind of pop art cyan colour scheme to make it easier for your eye to see the faint detail. Because our eyes, of course, respond differently to different colours. Um, but I think it also does give it this really kind of striking, as I say, pop art kind of feel, and we really liked the fact that he's showing a very kind of sciencey, techy subject, uh, which is set up in a very techy way, but producing something that he wants to make look really beautiful. The runner-up in this category is um, uh, Tunch Tezel from Turkey, and uh, Tunch has won in the competition before, uh, retrograde Mars and Saturn, and of course this really... Um, gets to the heart of a really profound aspect of the way the night sky works, something that bothered ancient astronomers, the fact that although the planets uh, appear to move around the Earth in lovely, perfect, circular paths, every so often they deviate from that and they do this little kind of backwards loop before continuing on their circular path. Of course, this was what eventually um, got Copernicus thinking of alternative models from the Earth being at the centre, coming up with a model where the Earth is a planet like the other planets. And, and of course, we now know what's going on here is this is 
uh, the Earth catching up with and overtaking those inner planets. So they don't stop orbiting the sun in the same direction. But as we go past them, from our perspective, they appear to sort of wiggle back and forth uh, as, we move, as we move around them. So a lovely piece of history of science in there. But this is months' worth, or certainly weeks' worth, of photography because he's photographing Mars and Saturn on different nights, equally spaced, and then compositing all of those images together to give you this time-lapse sequence of the two planets, Mars in the foreground and Saturn, of course, moving more slowly than Mars, so um, much more sp closely spaced uh, as you see it there. The winner in planets, comets and asteroids, though, is this beautiful one by Roger Hutchison, again from the, from the UK, Venus phase evolution. Now, what we really liked about this was the kind of the striking abstract composition. But of course, again, this is showing you a profound astronomical truth. This is how the, the appearance of Venus changes as it and we orbit the sun together. When Venus is far away from us on the far side of, of its orbit, we see almost the full disk lit up by the sun. But of course, it's far away, so it looks very small. As it gets closer to us, it gets, appears to get bigger, but also we can see less and less of the lit up side because it's closer to the sun than we are. And so at its largest, we only see sort of a, a very, very narrow crescent. And so putting all of those together to form this kind of, I don't know, space trumpet kind of composition we thought was a really lovely touch. And months and months of dedicated photography goes into that. Skyscapes, here we go, highly commended. Um, uh, Bartolomie uh, Juretsky from Poland, taken in Norway, however, um, and this is uh, nacreous clouds. So uh, we are very generous with our definition of astronomy. We, uh, we bring it down to the upper atmosphere, so aurorae and high-altitude cloud formations, and things like meteors are also counted as astronomical for our purposes. These beautiful ice crystal clouds with this sort of oil-on-water effect, really, really stunning. And again, with the, uh, with the jagged mountains kind of uh, silhouetted against it, really, really love that. Runner-up in this category was uh, Zongwu, um, and this is Star Trek in Kawakapo. This is a sacred range of mountains in China. Again, a long exposure, um, so the stars draw out trails as the Earth rotates, and this is lit by moonlight. Really beautiful, and you see the, um, the snow blowing off the peaks of the mountains. Um, we had a little bit of debate on the judging day about whether this was astronomical enough you know, some people, some of the judges were saying, well, it's gorgeous, but it's all, it's all about the mountains. And in the end, we decided it was just gorgeous and we had to, <laughs> we had to give it a prize. Um, and I, I do think it is astronomical. It's, it's got the beautiful star trails. So. But the winner in this category was this one, um, another Chinese photographer, Haitong Yu, Passage to um, the Milky Way. Um, and this is taken actually at a professional observatory, the, um, the Lamos uh, Observatory, which is a very powerful telescope in China. And it has this fabulous, brutalist concrete architecture, these two turrets, towers, linked by these um, walkways, and then with a sloping uh, bridge across as well. And uh, Haitung Yu has photographed the Milky Way through the building and produced this very beautiful, I think, um, sharp composition, one for fans of uh, the South Bank Centre and other brutalist architecture, I think, there, but really, really quite gorgeous. Uh, and a very different winner as well, not the pretty, pretty landscapes, but using the foreground to give a real structure to the, to the image. Stars and nebulae. Um, so we're zooming back out into the cosmos again. Highly commended um, is Andrei Borovkov, again with uh, NGC 281, the Pac-Man Nebula. I think you kind of have to squint at this. I often wonder what astronomers are on when they give these, uh, these nebulas names. But I think when you look at it through a, a less powerful telescope with your eye, you just see this vague circular blob with this, this sort of mouth notch taken out. And it does look, look a bit like Pac-Man. But through um, this uh, Andrew's telescope and with, with photography, you see so much more detail. Um, the, obviously, he's used different color filters. He's using that Hubble Space Telescope palette and the dark dust silhouetted against the, uh, the bright gas in the inner part of the nebula there. Runner up here. Um, Andras Pap, one stellar day. These are star trails. This is a full rotation of the Earth, just pointing the camera at the north pole of the sky and letting the stars rotate. However, you can't really do that, um, certainly not from the UK, because what happens is halfway through the, the day, the sun rises and the stars disappear. So Andras has had to take, by fixing his camera in exactly the same position, he's had to take several images of star trails throughout 
the year, when the sun, of course, is in different parts of the sky throughout the year. Uh, and so doing that, you get the full range of stars. And uh, when you composite it together, you get this amazing vinyl record effect. So um, showing us something that you could never see with the eye. And again, a lot of patience and planning has gone into that. And the winner of Stars and Nebulae was this fabulous image by Artem Mironov from Russia, the row of Fuki clouds. A very popular part of the sky to photograph, these sort of chaotic clouds of dust and gas. Uh, you've got reflection of blue starlight down here. You've got the pink uh, glow of hydrogen, and you've also got reddening by the dust, causing all of these colour effects. And the, the, again, um, he's chosen not to show the full nebula, but to home in on the detail to give it this really wonderful kind of composition divided by this dark band of gas here. So that's the main categories. We then have two special prizes, um, just to award different aspects of astrophotography. And the first one is robotic scope. Uh, things are changing rapidly in professional and astronomy, uh, amateur astronomy. And now amateur astronomers can sign up on the internet to use professional grade telescopes around the world, set in, up in very, very high profile um, dark sky sites alongside professional telescopes. Um, we don't really think it's fair to enter these alongside photos taken with people's personal kit, but we want to recognise the amazing work that's being done, especially since some of it is done by school kits. Um, and um, here we go. This is Gerald Riemann, uh, Encounter of Comet and Planetary. Here is the Planetary Nebula in the distance. Beautiful colours here. So again, a composite photo taken through several filters. And here is, I forget which comment, comment it is, but with this wonderful double tail and this um, very precise time when the comet happened to be very close in the sky. So near in our solar system, far well beyond the solar system. And again, we love that sort of slightly off-kilter composition um, which had to be planned, of course, by the photographer. Uh, so you've got the comet almost kind of pointing the way to the planetary nebula. And then we have the Sir Patrick Moore Prize for Best Newcomer. Sir Patrick was one of the judges in the early days of the competition. Um, he was a great supporter of the observatory and, and of the competition itself. And, of course, he's probably done more than anybody, um, certainly in the UK, to encourage new people to take up astronomy as a hobby or to take an interest. So this is named after him. And uh, the category is Jason Green, the Cone Nebula NGC 2264. And um, we love the sort of just the, the unrelenting uh, red and orange of this picture. Um, really amazing technical skill for a photographer who's only been doing astrophotography for you know, less than 12 months. But just, it had everything you're looking for. It's technically highly competent. It's a great composition, again, um, with this slightly sort of off-center kind of the cone itself pointing the way up to the bright star cluster. And just this uh, rather bold and daring choice to just go with the red colors and just give us a really red and orange image here, um, rather than playing around and having some sort of garish technicolor palette. OK, well, we. Um, We've awarded a lot of prizes, but we then have to pick one overall winner to be Insight Astronomy Photographer of the Year 2017. And um, the winner is picked from the winners of the main adult categories. Um, and it's often quite an intense debate, as you can imagine. <laughs> However, um, we all fixed on one that we, I think any of them could have won, but we decided that, that the one that was going to win this year was... Artem Mironov with the row of Yuki clouds, and it was just such a beautiful, colourful, kind of joyous photograph. It kind of makes your heart sort of leap, and it had that, that technical content to it as well. So uh, that is Insight Astronomy Photographer of the Year. Photography and astronomy are going to continue their amazing partnership, and we have got lots of amazing things to look forward to coming up over the next few years. Um, look out particularly for the James Webb Space Telescope, which is now going to be launched in, I think, spring 2019. It is the successor to Hubble. It will have a very different set of cameras to Hubble, attuned more to the infrared part of the spectrum, so light that we can't see. But its images are going to be amazing, and they're going to show stuff that we've never seen before. So keep your eyes peeled. Photography, astronomy have been partners since photography was born, and they are going to continue to show us amazing things about the universe. Thank you very much.
impeccable timing for an excellent lecture. So uh, we've got quite a bit of time for questions and um, open up to the audience. Or I'll start. <laughs> there we go, this gentleman there. Can oh, can you wait for the uh, microphone? We're actually recording the lecture, so um, if you wait for the microphone, then the, the people watching it later can hear the question as well as the answer. Can you say something about constructing images from way outside the visual range, whether it's X-ray or, or, or radio or whatever? And, and I don't know whether that counts as photography. But well, we, we see these images, don't we? It's, it's a good question, and it's certainly imaging. You're taking data information and conveying it in the form of an image. When I was a radio astronomer, we used to call those radio images maps, radio maps. Um, so whether, whether you can call them photography. Now, of course, um, with uh, computers and, and sort of Photoshop and other image uh, manipulation packages, you can take um, X-ray radio images and combine them with optical images. They're all digital data. So that is something that, that you do. You can combine images taken outside the visible spectrum. The big problem you have is um, if it's taken in, in a form of radiation that we can't see with our eyes, how do you display that in an image? that is designed to be seen by our, our eyes. So you have to, again, make choices about which visible colours you use to, to represent invisible wavelengths of light. And um, I've seen some great ones done by the Hubble team where they've got uh, visible images taken by Hubble and they've combined it with an X-ray image and a radio image of the same object. Um, and what they've done, sort of, kind of, with a nod to the actual way the spectrum is laid out, is that they've um, they coloured the, the, the Hubble image green and then they've coloured the X-ray image blue and the radio image red to make the point that radio is long wavelengths and X-rays is shorter wavelengths. So you get these kind of quite, again, quite garish um, images, but they're conveying a lot, of, a lot more information than a visible image could, could convey. So yes, now with computers, all of that data is all in the same format. It's all digital ones and zeros, and so you can combine them in all sorts of creative ways. Again, 20 years ago, you, you couldn't really combine a, a, a glass plate photograph with a radio map and, a, and an X-ray uh, kind of detection. You'd have to sort of print them out onto transparencies and stack them on top of each other, but now we can do all sorts of clever things. So computers have been the sort of the third, I think, um, element in, in these advancements, astronomy, photography, computers. Um, as you mentioned, that the Hubble Space Telescope successor being due in 2019, um, um, is, it, is, it, is it going to be likely to be as groundbreaking and, and uh, fruitful as a Hubble mission? Um, Hubble mission took us almost to the beginnings of the universe. I remember a small little dot, red dot, which was uh, one of the galaxies shortly after the after beginning of a, of a universe. So is it going by new mission? Likely so, to be as fruitful as, an, as a... James, well, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. And, of course, we hope it launches OK and it, it deploys OK. Hubble was designed to... It is, in, it is in Earth orbit and it was designed to be serviced by astronauts on the space shuttle. And they did several missions and upgraded it and repaired it, of course. Uh, and it was designed to last for 10 years and it's now lasted for 27 years and is still going... Um, yeah, it's a bit, bit um, frail and elderly now, but it's still going strong. So um, it has been incredibly fruitful, partly because it's just an amazing telescope, but also partly because it's been around for a very long time. James Webb is designed to um, go where Hubble cannot go. Um, Hubble, as you say, has shown us things so far away that we're seeing them as they were very early on in the history of the universe, but there is a limit to how far Hubble can see, uh, and James Webb is designed to go beyond that limit. So it should show us even earlier, even more distant things, galaxies um, in the process of formation that are, um, their light has been shifted into the infrared part of the spectrum where Hubble can't see it. So amazing things. It will also be able to see into the hearts of some of those dark nebulae where stars are forming in a way that Hubble cannot do. Um, so it's going to be, I think, as groundbreaking. The only problem is it has a limited lifespan. Um, because it is designed to be extraordinarily cold, because when you're taking photographs of faint heat signatures from the distant universe, you don't want the, the telescope itself to be glowing with, with heat. That would be like trying to take um, an image of the Orion Nebula um, with a flashlight right next to your telescope, completely pointless. So um, it, it is going to be very cold, and so it has to have a supply of um, liquid helium on board as a coolant, 
when that runs out, it will stop working. So I'm not sure what the lifespan is. Several years, but it's going to have to try and beat Hubble, I suppose, in that lifespan. The first call for proposals has gone out to the astronomical community, so we will see which ones get selected to get the time first on JWST. But they will be groundbreaking, I think, um, observations, all of them. It's the director, just one of the people working on it, and Edinburgh describes it as two weeks of terror deploying it. <laughs> yes, it will take two weeks, two, week, two weeks to get to where it's going. It has to be beyond the orbit of the moon. And... Um, and then it has to deploy all of the, these, its mirror and the, the uh, sorry, the sunshade, uh, which is the size of a tennis court, and it all has to unfold perfectly and everything has to switch on and boot up. So, you know, but... Oh, sorry, do you mind waiting for the microphone? Just so it, that's right. Would it be possible for um, astronauts actually to reach that telescope and do anything to it like they did with Hubble? With the technology we have at the moment, no, not possible. Um, if you think about it, this is further away than the moon, so we haven't been that far since 1972. We don't have that kind of rocketry technology. Of course, there are plans to build uh, technology to, to um, do that or even to surpass that. There are all of these grandiose plans to go back to the moon, to go to, the Mar to, to Mars. Uh, Elon Musk may tell you that he, he will be able to send people out there in six months' time. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe he's right. Maybe he, he will be able to do that, which would be amazing. <laughs> um, pretty amazing. Um, but no, at the moment, we don't have the technology to, to do it. So if it goes wrong out there, it is basically a hunk of junk um, orbiting the sun. So... Uh, we've seen some absolutely amazing photographs of amateurs really rivaling professionals and having access to the sort of uh, apparatus that uh, professionals have. They're quasi-professional, if not professional themselves. Is there anything that an amateur amateur <laughs> can do? A person with an ordinary camera, ordinary techniques, ordinary computer, because I'm sure that would release a lot of extra people to well, gazing and photographing. You're, you're absolutely right, and actually um, we're already at that stage, and I think what we really want to do is encourage more people to just get out there and, and get taking photos. When, um, when I use the word amateur uh, in reference to astronomers, I'm using it in absolutely the sort of traditional dictionary sense of the word, which is someone who really loves their subject and really knows and understands it. It's just they may not be paid to do it. Um, so some of these people have been doing it for donkey's years. However, already, as we see with the Patrick Moore Prize, with those kids, um, you don't necessarily need to have um, years of experience or the most expensive amateur telescopes and top-end cameras. You are now able to take photos with uh, things like this, which absolutely are of a quality that we would consider in the competition. And some of the photos, um, we have a short list of 150, um, which if you buy the book, actually they're all in the book. Many of those are taken by people who really would not consider themselves to be amateur astronomers at all. They're just people with a camera who saw something beautiful at night and decided to take a snap. So absolutely, yeah, go, go out there. If you, if you want to have a go, please do and, and submit your photos. £10,000 uh, out of one. <laughs> Do the judges only look at uh, screen images or do you ever print them out? Because printers' inks often change the appearance. Absolutely. These images are what we call digital-born, digital-native. They have never existed uh, as a physical object until we do something with them. So we do look at them on a computer screen when we're judging. Of course, when we display the winning photos, we display them in all sorts of different ways. They're online, so you again look at them on your computer screen. For the exhibition, uh, the free exhibition that's on in Greenwich at the moment, do you please come and see it. Uh, they are printed onto transparent uh, acetate and put on light boxes, and they really look beautiful with the light coming through them. In the book, of course, they're printed on glossy photographic paper, and they look amazing there. But they look different. 
when, you know, in those different media. And so that's something also to bear in mind. And it's that thing, I think, that we should all bear in mind when we look at photographs, that this, these are representations, uh, and the camera does not see the, the world in the same way, exactly the same way as our eyes do. And also how you then present those images also <coughs> depends um, on the medium. So photography is not, is not the same as looking. It's a powerful tool. It's a wonderful tool. But we need to remember what it actually is. Just one last question, then, Tony. You mentioned at one stage that people living in light polluted areas can combat light pollution to a certain extent by using narrowband filters. How are they going to cope as councils increasingly use full spectrum LEDs in their streetlights? A very good question. Um, I think anyone who is concerned about light pollution, this is, this is uh, a worry. Of course, those LED streetlights, one of the reasons people use them is that they use less electricity, they're cheaper. They save money, but as you say, they cover the whole spectrum with light pollution. So those orange skies may look a bit garish, but at least it's one very specific colour of orange emitted by sodium atoms and as we saw with Sebastian Grech's image, you can filter that out. But this is, this is an issue, and I think anyone who's concerned about this, if you're um, talking to your council and trying to persuade them to look at the other alternatives, there are lots of other alternatives for really great lighting solutions, which are just as cheap, don't pollute uh, the sky. Um, so it's the, the, the spectrum of light that's emitted, but also the design of the lights themselves. Standard um, street light designs, some of them, actually 30% of the light does ne doesn't even go down on the street. It just goes straight into the sky. So that's 30% of the light, 30% of the electricity, 30% of the carbon footprint not lighting the street at all. Uh, and 30% of the electricity bill, let's not forget, uh, but just polluting the sky. So... This is an issue. Good lighting design is, is an important thing. Um, just going for the cheap option is not always the best solution, I think. OK, and um, with that, I think uh, we'll bring it to a close. But uh, um, I'll just, before we thank Mary, I'll just mention about next month we have... Uh, this, is, this should be very good as well. Michelle Doherty, who was the lead uh, principal investigator on the Cassini mission here in the UK. And she'll be talking about Cassini, the grand finale, the end of the Cassini mission that Marek mentioned. Uh, that's on the 14th of November, so please do come along to that. And other than that, I think we should thank Marek for a wonderful lecture. Thank you.